I have before been called a hater. This may shock you. When the Chibnall era was on television, uh, I went into it as a fan, ready to enjoy. I came out of it still trying to enjoy. What did and what didn't work, that doesn't matter for this video too much. Because when I really liked the 13th Doctor, it was when she wasn't on television. When I say off television, I do of course mean the expanded media. Hello, I'm Josh. I'm here to help Sam um, on this, this wild journey that we're going to take you through. I love all of Doctor Who. I think the worst Doctor Who and the best Doctor Who are not really that far apart from each other. Every bad story is a couple of tweaks away from being a good story and vice versa. So I'm approaching this this wonderful little thought experiment uh, from sort of neutral ground, I'd say. You're my neutral test subject. Yes, I am. I'm your beige man for the evening. The 13th Doctor was so big and fun for me on every medium, sometimes including TV. Uh, but over those years, so many writers were doing great things with the tools they were given. Can I take what was being done in these other mediums? And I've presented Josh here with a dream Jyoti Whittaker 2.0. Series 11, a new Series 12, a new set of specials, a new Doctor Who, a Chris Chibnall overhaul. The Redux. The Redux. Yeah. Jody 2.0, we were calling it for like four years. Yeah. I, I made Josh a reading list. I've looked back. Do you know when we started this project, Josh? I mean, it was a while ago. Uh, we started this in 2021. Jesus Christ, really? Jody Whitaker was still the doctor. COVID-19 fresh on our lips. Um... That is insane. <laughs> well, this has been a long time coming, mainly because basically Sam tweeted out this list of, of stories of like, oh, this could be fun as like a parallel version of, of the 13th Doctor's era. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to watch slash read slash consume it all in order. Partly because you had never touched the Doctor on the other mediums. Exactly. And partly just to see works it does it work as a hypothetical thought exercise uh, or a bit of tv not that i am you know a professional script editor in any way but i'm sort of approaching it with that mind i mean you are you're an you're an award-winning writer in fairness don't don't tell anyone i work in insurance <laughs> um look all of the bits that don't work to, next to each other, like all of the connective tissue, basically, I'm trying to sew together. You tell me what did work, you tell me what doesn't work, you tell me what could hypothetically work. Let's just bounce some ideas off each other. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm in. So, set the scene. It's Christmas 2017. The old man's gone, and he's turned into swearing northerner Jodie Whittaker. I was ecstatic and i thought going forward the journey with Kira could be lighter perhaps freer tv go back to its adventuring roots and just have fun with the premise rather than being tied down with all the baggage that preceded it in the revival and for series 11 to give it credit for the most part that's what it did but this new version i've substituted some things out it's a lot of variety and a lot of what some people might even call filler adventures. Mm -hmm. But the filler is where the fun is. Yes! We have not actually had a sort of like a standalone story written by a guest writer. We have not had that for four years. Cool. So it's quite refreshing. Sort of most of it has been taken up by a lot of heavy, lore heavy stories. A lot of series arcs, a lot of um, series maintenance, a lot of busy work. Mm. The way I like to look at it is uh, Demons of the Punjab. Does that episode exist unless you'd given a clean slate back in 2018 to a new writer? No, probably not. And Doctor Who had never seen a bit of TV like that before. Mm -hmm. Give the same writer Fugitive of the Jadoon, yeah. which is less, you know, someone self-expressing their vision of the show. And I think you get what I'm getting at here. We're going to be going for all of the former, almost none of the latter. So with we're keeping that, any big changes you want to make for the 13th Doctor as a character? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, Ooh, okay. I, I, you Honestly, know, kind of same. Yeah, I, I think I think the changes, the natural changes, would occur in the way that these stories play out. Just sort of these one-off adventures. I can't guarantee that you're going to be safe. We know, really, because when I pull that lever, I'm never quite sure what's going to happen. 
I think we start exactly the same way. Perfect. Yeah, I don't. I can't really criticize much about series eleven Whitaker because mm-hmm. other than maybe I would make her not the main character if we get back to a heart and all style dynamic. Number one, that's how you make a big Tardis team work. Number two, yeah. I just I think it'd be cool in the revival to have a tour guide type figure who will just not hang in the background per se. Hey, but uh, we had Dan. We had Dan. Did we have Dan? <laughs> Dan wanted to be a tour guide. And where did that get him, Josh? Where did that get him on the side <laughs> well, of we'll the street? Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to so, that, I'm sure. <laughs> who else is on the side of the street? Uh, oh my God, famous drama actress Jodie Whittaker. She falls to Shen... She falls... Not Shenfield. <laughs> <laughs> So our new Doctor falls to Earth in Sheffield. I'm guessing we're keeping the hub. There's nothing wrong with it, right? Yes. In this, uh, Chibnall only has, what's it? In this new version, three scripts in Series 11, which we think is the ideal amount, really, a showrunner should be putting himself on the table. Yeah. Because you want to keep a diversity in tone of voice as well as setting and plot, right? Exactly. Exactly. You want all of those fresh new voices. But anyway, let's start with Chibnall, because Woman Who Fell to Earth, in my opinion... There's not really many changes to make. I think it's Ooh, okay. I think it's a I think it's a really good, really solid series opener. I think series openers are, are hard enough as it is without trying to make it heaven sent. You know? And it doesn't need to be heaven sent. You just need a fun piece mm-hmm. that's light and a bit breezy to get through. Which is gonna set the tone for our series eleven massively, by the way. Okay. I'm not a big fan of Women Who Fell to Earth. I don't think it's good or bad, but it's super generically functional in the same way that, you know, Church and Ruby Road is. Even down to the villain threat being a fairly generic, uh, fairly derivative take on something else. You know, one of them's Labyrinth. Um, yeah. This is Predator. <laughs> and it, there doesn't have to be much more to it than that because, you exactly. know, we're focusing on our new companions. And on that subject, is the 13th Doctor falling slightly to the left, or is she going to fall slightly to the right and meet no. Dan the Plasterer? No, that you would know? be to the left, Sam. You need you need to check your geography. Liverpool is to the left of Sheffield, Sam. She lands on his house, crushing it. <laughs> <laughs> but as a northerner, it was just fun to see somewhere that isn't London or Cardiff, or <laughs> Cardiff dressed like London. So I... I'm, I'm, I'm excited by the prospect of Sheffield being the base camp, and I like having some northerners in. Actual northerners? One note, please don't make Tossing Cole do a Sheffield accent. It's hard to act through, isn't it? Ryan as a character would just be so much more comfortable with Tossing Cole's accent. I, I remember thinking all the way through the uh, Chipnall years, this TARDIS team would be so much better if everyone just kind of played themselves. Like, from what we see of Maddox Gill and Jerry Whittaker, if they just had a little bit more of that imbued into their personalities, I think we'd have a lot more fun. I can see where you're coming from with that, and I, I, do, I do sort of agree to an extent. You know, if they'd have done a dodo here and just dropped the accent in the second you know, story, I, I wouldn't have minded. <laughs> I like that you're still going to have him have it for one episode. Interesting take. Yes. I actually, I'm, I'm going to limit it down. I want Tossing Cole to do a Sheffield accent for his first scene and that scene alone. Interesting. Bizarre. Women Who Fell to Earth, we're not even really changing anything. It's a Chibnall script, so there's a lot of um, house cleaning to do. You can type a lot of uh, loose ends, a lot of just complications can... that don't need to be there um I'll probably in my opinion change the ending introduce that this is a doctor who doesn't need to violently end the episode maybe she can just find some crazy one piece style off kilter third option that can end the episode or maybe even a comedic note tim shaw realizes ah yeah no shit getting into crypto would be way better i can see that so, <laughs> so look, something to that i'm not chris chibnall i've never claimed to be chris chibnall Ryan vlogging goes nowhere. There's even a shot where we see a Polaroid camera on his desk and there's like a load of Polaroids on his room. So maybe he's a keen photographer as well. But I just love the idea of someone trying to film their adventures in time and space. And I think you could use that throughout the series just for fun character beats. I just think there's some comedic and and dramatic potential there that I think is sort of untapped. I think the lines, the jokes write themselves in that matter. 
uh, let's say he starts off as a vlogger and he finds his feet slowly as like a journalistic type and he just puts like a, a radio mic in a monster's face and goes uh, sorry can you speak to this yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly there's, f- there's fun to be had in there you know also like documenting their own evidence of their basic basically crimes uh, that they commit later <laughs> in the series um, is also got a good comedic potential the 13th doctor of course grays out or it blurs every single photo from the polaroid with a sonic right <laughs> exactly yes absolutely but also is in the background with peace signs and sticking her tongue out you know <laughs> yeah she's photo bombing she's definitely photo bombing i'm loving um, the dynamic with we're, we're we're painting already you mentioned the sonic there I mean, I I would I would tone it down, is is all I would say. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put the Sonic in a fire. I'm not gonna the visitation it. You know, maybe pull back the usage a little bit, but it does become a bit of a wavy magic wand. In the same way as Davison, she also does seem to care for her Sonic more than any of her companions. Which I don't mind, Cody, because I like the sort of chaotic inventor shtick that gets set up in this. Yes. Um, that I wish was more prevalent at some times. Like, I love the idea of the Doctor just living in a garage (laughs) rather than living in a junkyard um, if we're bringing back parallels to, like, season one. It's a lovely untapped aesthetic. Um, The direction I'm going with 13 is more like a hippie fairy child type. Lighter, breezier, grinning Doctor you see in Demons of the Punjab would be kind of her personality throughout her whole run. She's not going to be the priority, so she doesn't need to go through highs and lows, you know what I mean? I'm fine with her being a pretty static character, and I'm going to do something with that later, I think. Okay. I quite like that. And since there's not much to talk about with Woman Who Fell to Earth, let's just go into our companions. Um, I've played around in my head, like, it's that age-old question, is three companions too much, Josh? No. It's not the size, it's how you handle it, Sam. Um, Which the 13th does abysmally. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think it's weird that we have these conversations that that Doctor Who can't juggle four main characters, especially when you have so many shows that have massive ensembles that are doing it very, 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 very well. It's just a case of juggling it well. Or even a different approach to the stories that you tell, frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't need such plot-heavy adventures, maybe, if... We do want to focus on characters so much. I can picture the comments now. It'll be some combination of... Um, they should have just had, like, Yaz and Graham, or Ryan and Graham, or... No, that uh, doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't, no, does it? It I'm doesn't, just, no. Just, you... In my head... Sorry, um, I'm trying to remember the name. Grace. In my head, at one point, I was like, maybe Grace and Graham is the, is the TARDIS team. And it's a fun what-if, mm-hmm. but... Um, for the cause of this, that'd be too drastic a, a change. Yeah, it's our, it's my job to make these three work for you in this new setting. In yeah, this new context. and I I think I think that you they definitely can work, and they do work at times in the actual show, and they definitely work a lot in the expanded media as well. I think I mean if I'm honest, you said about Grace there, I'd even go as far as to say. Let's crowd it even more. There's even an argument that a better idea than cutting a companion would be to stick Grace in for like three episodes and then kill her off. Why fridge one of the most likable characters you introduce in your opening episode? It's, yeah. It's a set of stakes, of course. You have to make her likable to take her away, but... Uh, we're not going to do that. I don't think we're going to do that. I, th- I think we should keep her as, as it is for now because I... Underground. Buried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not that I want to, okay. but I just think there is an argument that adding her in would be just as difficult to manage as taking Mm -hmm. someone else out because the dynamics completely change so i agree i think we just stick with the three that we've got and like you said we just try and make it work and i think the stories we've got will make it work i don't think we have to have all three companions necessarily for every single adventure sheffield can be a stop gap Mm -hmm. just continuously if this episode just says graham and ryan sure doesn't need an explanation you know so the revitalized versions here's our new TARDIS team Josh we've got obviously Graham Mm -hmm. not much has to be changed no I like Graham the experienced working class mediator Um, there's no problem there yep it's fun to have someone with more experience next to someone who's much much older but doesn't act it you know Mm -hmm. Uh, within the doctor who's acting more youthful than ever to be honest it's with Yaz and Ryan I want to make a couple changes okay uh, to me, they're very different characters in my head as to what we're actually given in the show. With Yaz and Ryan, I want to set up like a 
a conflict in the TARDIS team. In the same way, Zoe and Jamie bounce off each other because they're polar opposites. Mm -hmm. I want to do a similar thing with uh, these two school kids. Okay. Yaz is going to be our authoritative good companion you know the, the cop who starts off the series as a uh, total lawful good stickler for the rules yeah. um sometimes maybe even to the point that it's a bit annoying and then we've got ryan on the complete other end of the spectrum a sensitive idealist um he's got lots of thoughts about change i mean you have to really factor in something i'm going to be very big on is this show is coming out in 2017 to 2022 yeah it's a lot of social change in those years yeah it's literally a different planet that we live on right now from right Jodie Whittaker was announced like a couple of months before Trump came in is that right it's a it's a Trump Black Lives Matter COVID-19 world um and you do see that change in the ship only years to the credit but there's not enough of it there's not enough of those cutting Ryan lines like can you believe this? Yeah, I can. You don't get enough of the parts, that, to me, that really work with the character. In the end, I mean, I've written Ryan myself in a little short story, and I think I see him as a character who gets radicalised by travelling in the TARDIS. Hmm. Um, you could do the same with Yaz. I like the um, idea of Yaz d- disillusioning her with the sort of authority that she's aligned herself with at the start of series 11 to the end which they do they do do a little bit to be honest because i'm she... not sure i think she finishes her story with a gun <laughs> already branching a gun you know what i mean okay you got me um <laughs> <laughs> yeah you got me there um it's a police officer and a young black kid come on these are two supercharged starting positions for mm-hmm. when the context of this is coming out and um, for Ryan, you know, we did a bit about the camera. He's an enthusiastic kid who comes into the TARDIS branching a Polaroid camera. You know, like that's mm. a great image for a companion. And hopefully that enthusiasm can be infectious. Definitely play on the fact that he's young a lot more, right? Yeah. Which I'm sure Cole could do, even though he looks like <laughs> the not that. Yeah. But there's something there that I've always loved in Ryan. It's going to become clear as we go for these episodes that Yaz and Ryan are two parts of the Doctor's psyche, sort of made literal. Yeah. The really authoritative part and the, I mean, you remember Mistress of Chaos, right? I do. I do. We'll get to that. Yeah. (laughs) There are two companions as avatars for the two minds that the Doctor is always in. Mm -hmm. Because, spoiler, in this run, the Doctor is not going to be very politically minded the stories can be but i don't want 13 to be a very proactive doctor yeah i want her companions to be the her voices for that instead i like that i can take that basically what we're doing is uh series 11 is obviously heartening back a lot to see season one and you get a lot of that in season one with the fact that ian and barbara are basically the moral compasses of of the the start of doctor who and the doctor sort of absorbs that in Good to do, like you said, when there's sort of a major social change. The 13th Doctor is going to be kind of a neutral figure. Even if the show isn't, she is going to be, because that's what's going to lead our characters to ultimately leave. I want okay. Yaz and Ryan to leave the TARDIS because they've kind of been unconsciously radicalised by travelling, fighting injustices across the stars. It's what would happen um ryan with orphan 55 and environmental change yeah. and seeing all the political satire of revolution of the daleks could do the same to yes etc i think both of them even though they're completely separate people do end up going through this massive change on the doctor's behalf and they leave because they feel unsatisfied with the social change and impact they can actually make in a sci-fi adventure serialized series you know traveling in the tardis like, yeah you can learn a lot from Doctor Who. It's a great platform for developing political consciousness. But Doctor Who shouldn't be expected to fight the wrongs of the country single-handedly, you know? There's a point where you as an audience member have to jump off and make that change yourself. Okay, fair play. I like that. So I, my run is going to be <laughs> in the wake of everything that's happening circa 2018 to 22. Uh, mine is propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Who is saying, get out onto the streets because I can't fight your battles for you. I, I just travel in the box. Nice. I like it. Let's go into some episodes. <laughs> now I'm, I'm going to get into the 
into the nitty gritty of let, let's thread these together because I do think it is a big shame to kill off the Ghost Monument cliffhanger because it is a very, very fun Doctor who cliffhanger at the end of Woman Who Fell to Earth where they just land in space. Can I tell you what I'm planning to do with that? I'm just changing the destination. Oh, well, that's fine. They just teleport into the middle of space and in time to join the story of the comic by Jodie Hauser, A New Beginning. That's good, right. Because if we can do that, can we keep the start of the ghost monument? Because that first five minutes... That really strikes a mark with people, doesn't it? Yeah. That image. So I don't know how you would make it work. Maybe it's just someone picks them up. Sure. They can end up in the time agent ship. Yes. Yes. We'll get we'll get onto them, I'm Not sure. Not a problem there at all. Um, a New Beginning is the very beginning of the Titan range and what they did for the 13th Doctor. Uh, they didn't have the character for very long, but everything they did was helmed by one author who is absolutely perfect for this TARDIS team and making her seem like a good little angel girl. Um, it's her characterization of the 13th Doctor that I've fallen absolutely in love with. Yes. And that's jo- is that Jodie Hauser? It is. Jo- Jodie Hauser is great. I, if I have to thank you for one thing that you've ever done in my life, and you've done many. So, really? Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. Actually being my sort of guiding light in Doctor Who comics, because I'd never read a Doctor Who comic before this. You see a lot of them in these videos because um, I was raised on them. And I love them. Uh, especially this 13th Doctor run, which is where I've spent most of my comic time so far. It's a really fun story because I'm trying to imagine them as TV episodes. Um, So obviously there's a lot of changes that would have to be made to make a comic story a TV story. I think this is structured like a TV script. It's even got the frenetic, never stop pace of a Chibnall story. It's not far off, yeah. They're always running. It, it It is really well paced. There is a wonderful moment near the end of this story where the Doctor summons the TARDIS with a sonic, and that could be your Ghost Monument-style TARDIS reveal. Lovely. We could still not have seen the TARDIS up until the the end of this story. I love the Ghost Monument reveal of the TARDIS because it's a very heartfelt moment, the kind of stuff that I'm trying to work into these stories to make them work as a series. But keep, keep the strengths, keep the emotional highs of the episodes that we're exactly. kind of erasing. I think the Ghost Monument gets a really rough deal, um, but I do think this works as a really good display of this TARDIS team. The only person who really gets a bit of a roar end of the deal is Ryan, uh, but Yaz gets a lot to do in this. The transferable skills from being a police officer. Talking to kids. Um, so A New Beginning follows two time traveller experimenters from the future who on their first trip they, they discover time travel, but they end up in the lair of the Collector, who has basically just brandished them as slaves. Uh, you work for me now, you're going to add to my lovely collection of things, and you're going to bring me children. I want children, actually, in my collection at the minute. And this is, of course, where they meet the Doctor and company. Now, they are time travellers themselves, so even if we are doing the Lost TARDIS narrative, we can still do this gorgeous two-page spread of them going through all these different time periods trying to find something. I'm looking at Ryan at the pyramids. I'm seeing Yaz with the dinosaurs. This can all still be done with uh, our new time traveling friends. And honestly, we can keep the guest stars from Ghost Monument. This story requires one male and one female space future person. Why not just lift them directly? Yeah, I like that. We can we can keep those castings. Um it's effects heavy, so it really will have to be a, a wow yeah. one. Um I think we're gonna take the budget away from some of these other episodes. Some of these are smaller budget though, so that works. Uh, New beginnings big. Even even the grunts in this look absolutely nuts. Yeah, it's it's gonna be the the sort of end of the world of this era. You know, big aliens on show. Splash some cash around. This is what we've got. The design of the hoarder is so cool. Cinematically, I want it to look like... Remember those cinema trailers? We're 13 in the mirror room. Yeah. Like, I want that kind of look for this story. I just want like glitzy and gleaming and colourful and CGI, but like a painting CGI. Yeah. I'm in. It's written out as an issue one, so it works as an episode two. Everyone's smiling. That's my main takeaway from A New Beginning. Everyone is gleaming with grins. You know what I mean? Even when shit gets to the fan, uh, it's it's a different vibe that I'm, I find infectious. Yeah. 
the final page, the final note to end up, I think this will be the Doctor's first, oh, that's the Doctor moment. Um, Ryan says, that bit you said earlier about choosing friends over fear, is that why you brought us along with you? She says, that's part of it, but not at all. You know when you've seen your favourite film dozens of times, what's the one thing you can do to make it feel brand new again? Uh, show it to someone who hasn't seen it before? Exactly. New eyes, they can make even the universe itself feel new too. Oh, fuck, that is so good. Perfect, that's a goddamn mission statement. Yeah, they really fucking nailed it with these comic runs. Um, There is so much gold in terms of just giving Jodie her flowers and just, like, letting her go for it. It does just make me sad, like, that these are comics and we don't get to... Because I just think Jodie would play those moments with such (laughs) excitement and joy. Totally. A a real kick-in-the-teeth starter. Yeah, it's an adrenaline shot. It's it's something genuinely new feeling for the show. I, I wouldn't ask for anything better to start us off. The episode also does end with a little gold robot joining them in the TARDIS. I do not remember this. I have um, forgotten remember, this. She ro- <laughs> it's, it's a joke. <laughs> she reprograms a drone to save them in the finale. Like It's her final like, little gambit. But for some reason, she brings it into the console and it marches in. Oh, let's keep that. So, let's keep it. I like a little TARDIS friend. A pet. A little pet. Yeah. I think that's funny, but our next story will not require a little gold robot. <laughs> well, that's fine. We'll, ca- we'll canine this shit. We'll um, we'll bring in a little funny robot, and then we will tra- we will trap it in a blue box for for eternity. It's the equivalent of the TARDIS yeah. cat, and I think the main joke with this thing, if I just thought of it on the spot, is that it is shit, and we're we're joking about the past. We don't yeah. want to bring it out. Like the companions are evident; they're actually visibly like, nah. <laughs> but let's cut the robot. Yeah, I like that, and let's call it if we if we're doing the cat thing, let's call it Percy. That's maybe the bravest choice we've made so far. On to episode three. Yeah, this is a shit hot choice. I actually wrote, this would be a shit hot third story based Davis, which shows that I wrote these notes into 2021 because, you know, based Davis is a bit of a cringe thing to write down. But it is factual. But yes, that is factual uh, because you have put Demons of the Punjab as the third story, which just, it just works as a third story, I think, really well. How long does it take Yaz to get the focus of an episode in series 11? Yeah, I think I think it really benefits being brought a little bit earlier. One of my other notes that I wrote is just, I fucking love demons. That's all I, I just wrote that. It might be the best bit of Doctor Who TV we've had since Capaldi, yeah. Yeah, not really a lot that I would change people might be thinking immediately oh so where's rosa gone this is the thing when i originally sent you the layout i put rosa further down the season Mm -hmm. um this partially because it's a weirder story than demons of the punjab the premise is odd we've still got woman who fell to earth monday new beginning future demons of the punjab past we've still got our one two three hit punch yeah but Either way, whether we keep it or not, the Chibnall era, what it's really good at is looking at the past in new ways, making the historicals exciting again. Absolutely. Yes. I think the only thing that I wrote was the only thing you'd need to do is make the companions a bit more green around the gills and just basically you just lift all of the being awestruck about being in the past stuff from Rosa and just plonk it here. 13 is talking about the rules of time travel at the beginning of Punjab. Even if it's a kid's first season of Doctor Who, we're explaining how the past works right away. But we're also telling the adults, this is how the past episodes work now. Yeah. It, teaching your kid what they will, what you didn't learn in history class. Exactly, yeah. It was such a nice feeling as well when I first watched it. I just never learned about it. I didn't I didn't know this because nobody taught me. Um, and obviously there's an element of, you know, you've got to go out and learn this kind of history yourself when you get to a certain age. But, but also it's- Doctor Who presented as a state-sanctioned alternative to the syllabus, a different history syllabus. It's lovely. Bang on, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just shit hot. Um, <laughs> my, I, actually, one... <laughs> One, one little note, um, which isn't really a, it, it's not really a change to the episode, it's more a change to the era. And a, a sort of a question, why was Yaz's nanny 
not a recurring character. Um, it's a fantastic question. Because if you had Yaz's nanny actually remember the events of Demons of the Punjab and urges her to time travel oh because she knows she has to, because she knows she met her in the past, then you have sort of a Wilf esque recurring character there. I love that. You don't even have to bring her back as much as you think, but, you know, just when we dip back into Sheffield every now and then, even just, like, at the beginning or end of some stories... We don't have Arachnids in the UK anymore, so we don't even have Yaz's um, short-lived family. Let's use Nana. Let's use Nana more. She's actually a little bit weirder. Mate, if, if we meet her in Woman Who Fell to Earth, which you could definitely add in... I want Yaz's nanny to make a pass at Graham... And as if, as yeah. if she's known him for a long time. Yeah, that's cute. <laughs> and and it's now it's long. We're like, you look better yeah. than I remember. I love that. That's very silly, but a, a very good detail. And it also humanizes Yaz. I think she, whilst Ryan is mm. a bundle with enthusiasm, excited to be doing stuff. I think Yaz should very much until this episode be eager to return yeah, home. I like that. We haven't had that in the revival yet. Yes. And an, a reaffirmation from her nan at the end would be fantastic. And perfectly placed for that well i'm glad that you like that addition because armchair writing can be good um yeah. better <laughs> we should write doctor who this is why no, samuel no, davis we said thing. we weren't gonna say this. i we think this. this sam you're just like I, i've said this to you you're just like every other hater every other <laughs> chibnall hater you just you just want to be a a white man on the internet saying uh-huh. i can write doctor who better than this guy from formby <laughs> I think it's very funny that we've both written our own Doctor Who series. Uh, but, yeah. But mine are a perfect example of why I should not ever write for the fucking show because they're two very heated, specific counterattacks on existing parts of Doctor Who. Okay. Which is exactly what the show needs less of. But yeah. it's a fun bit of fan text, as is this list that we're doing right now. Yeah, I, I, I'm having fun with this, but I do just want to say, I want to keep reiterating this, I do not think that I am a better TV writer than award-winning Chris Chibnall. I think you are. No, I'm not, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we are um, an hour into this video. The, the spiel goes about saying, you would hope, right? We've covered our asses. <laughs> yes, and we are only three episodes in to an entire five-year run of Doctor Who. Maybe we so speed it up a bit. How do you feel? Let's that? let's do a, let, let's speed run a few. Collateral of Ivanhoe, episode four. Our mutual friend William Carlyle, Mister Tardis himself, wrote this little story. I think it was back in lockdown. It was like 2020, 2021-ish time. Um, and I actually auditioned to be in this. Uh, I didn't get it. It was before I knew Will. A failed cast. And uh, I will make sure that I use my my pulling power to get in any future productions. Jeez. Um, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, nepotism in within the Doctor Who fandom is terrible. Um, Don't worry, it's awful at Cardiff as well. <laughs> anyway. Oh, okay. Can- if anyone's rolling their eyes, us including a fan work, I want to dissuade that, yeah, that notion right no, now. Don't be silly. Because it holds... It holds its absolute own. I think it's unfair that Will can just casually write a, a kind of a fluff, fun ad- adventure piece. Yeah. And I'm just sat here like, oh, you could do that the whole time, huh? Yeah, and I remember Will pitching it because I think Will basically set himself very strict limitations of this is what would happen if I was commissioned to write a script to Doctor Who in the year 2020. I've literally written it fits like a glove. I've put as well, it's a great story to establish 13 as a very kind doctor who's just sorting out fair play and writing their own wrongs as well. I I love that element of the story. In this case, because it's partially a sports story, a sci-fi sports story, uh, fair play can be literal. I do want to add a little part where she is refereeing a game of something. Oh, I like that. Let's do that, yeah. It's a it's a good environment to explore. And also, I did write a little note, because I'm intrigued about where you stand on this in terms of this series, because it's quite a big part of the latter stages. Okay. Phasmin. Right. I want it to stay, and I just want to bring it in earlier, because I think there are some lovely moments in Collateral of Ivanhoe that could act as 
the dawn of Phasmin, in my opinion. Oh, okay. Uh, I, hey, I'm looking at this, and I think some of the episodes we've cut were the beginnings of Phasmin, uh, the invention of Phasmin. So I have no problem about this. I think it would benefit from being subtext, like like in text, obvious. But I don't think we need stories about it until the late game. I, I do insist on that. Look, I know writers who use subtext and they are they, all cowards. They're, they're all cowards. Um, but there is a moment, I don't want to spoil it because I want everyone to go and listen to it because it's really, really good. But there is a, a moment that I will refer to as the trust moment um, in the story between the Doctor and Yaz, which is the perfect little spark for Thasmin, I think. I think many of us could agree the fun was in the chase. It was in the piecing together of of things. So let's keep that for, yeah, for, yeah, yeah, for yeah, all the yeah. fans out there. We can in, and we can incorporate it later in a way that doesn't make thirteen out to be a callous arsehole. How about that? Yeah. Okay. Remember, this iteration of the Thirteenth Doctor and Yaz are more like the actors' counterparts that we've heard about in production notes. So th- yeah. there's less of the infantilization and less of the keeping secrets, and th- there's less of all of that. So. At no point. We'll definitely could... get to that because we we I, I I think we've been we've been quite on the same page so far, and I think there are things that I will I will push back on in the next video. Absolutely, that'll be exciting. Um, yeah, so please go check that out if you haven't heard it because it is a really good and it's free Doctor Who. Like. It's on YouTube right now. When I think of Clatter of Ivano, I think back of like the action set pieces. Will writes. Uh, action over audio really well uh it's good actors as yeah. well of course but like i think of them underneath the stadium with explosives all around them it's a perfect doctor who location yeah jonathan carley plays graham in that and he's 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 got a really good Graham. oh i want this to be graham's episode uh honestly yes. because yaz has had one uh ryan's sort of been the main character in the first two really it's it's free it's footy. It's space footy. Yeah, give Graham, give Graham a go. He's wearing his West Ham scarf. He's a West Ham fan. As a, as as someone who, well, I mean, not not so much anymore, but has has always had a, a little love affair with football. I think the fact that Graham never got a, a full on footy story um, does make me quite sad. So I hope that in the expanded media, he got three. He did. He got. I've I've read. I've had two of them. So um, I need to hunt down the third. But yeah. No, this this is a great little bit of fun. Awesome. Let's keep the let's keep the pace. Hidden Human History. Ooh. Another comic. It's Jody Hauser again, back in the same Titan Comics range. Yeah. We're veering back into those um, because Hidden Human History has such a different tempo for a Doctor Who story. And I think you might be seeing a pattern with what I'm doing so far in Series 11. Uh, Tim Shaw is not going to be dealt with conventionally. Uh, Deems of the Punjab is a new kind of story. Hidden Human History is a new kind of story. I'm kind of playing on the formula, but not in a Moffat way. I'm just trying to open the playing field for every writer. What do you love about Hidden Human History as someone who read it as a homework task from me? I <laughs> I just had a good time with it. I, I mean, it's been a while since I actually, because like I said, we've been working on this for so long. Yeah, I've actually um, forgotten some elements, but from memory, I... I've written down that I really like this, and it's a Docky Who episode about a podcast, so it's a bit of me. 13 has so many really cool moments in this. She's so fucking cute. She's so good in this. So good. She's adorable in this. There's a bit where um, they, they, Yaz points to the doctor, says she's sort of like our, she's sort of like our girl in charge. She's the designated mm. driver, and she does this cute little face yeah. that I, I love. I love, love, love. To me, in that image, that's what I wanted the 13th Doctor to be always. And there's there's a ton of stuff like that in, in here. There's the Doctor saying that she listens to podcasts with the TARDIS all the time. I love that. That's another thing that they do in the comics a lot. Just treating the TARDIS as a character rather than a, a hub. Um, and having the Doctor and TARDIS dynamic be an actual character dynamic. Uh, this is also a very Chibnally story because it's got a lot of locations um, and it's really nicely paced. And I did write, this story would cost a fucking fortune. <laughs> um, there is there is no budget cutting on this. This is not your love no, and monsters, I, oh, everybody. I this hadn't is thought your, of that part. There this, is a lot of location hopping. You know, if I'm playing producer in this, we've got to stay on budget, guys. Oh, Phil. Stay on budget. <laughs> 
I think Human History uh, is kind of a small sequel to A uh, New Beginning, uh, in that we meet our two time traveling friends again who are now time agents. Yeah, I love having the time agents as sort of your interlinking thread throughout the series. In- in- inter-series links is really are really underrated, and I think could make even the worst yeah. story shine a bit. Really, there. really fun pays off on weekly viewing you know when you're a kid uh, that's got to feel mega yeah especially because it's like three three weeks after like do you remember being on the game station in bad wolf and then realizing oh, we've been here before yeah that was see that's the kind of stuff that i like and yeah bringing back the time agents as sort of recurring characters the tardis crew arrive in a number of different locations and the doctor's getting a little bit worked up that her friends know all about history better than her like uh, she'll go and be like this is the town of blah 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 and all of them at once are like oh right yeah yeah i know about this i listen to a documentary podcast about it and this starts a strange conspiracy where everyone seemingly has listened to this podcast including people from thousands of years in the future uh what can this mean well there's some blood-sucking alien monsters living in the past and it comes together to make a really sweet tea time story that doesn't have to end dramatically it ends with a nice chat over some tea i have a real type of story don't i yeah because it's a 13th doctor podcast story doesn't mean that we can't have redacted later on uh, because... honestly i think redacted's happening fuck it let's start it right out the gate we can do whatever we want right series 11 and then there's a podcast as promotional material every year to follow it redacted as an episode a special that's fun redacted as an episode and a podcast maybe redacted takes rosa's spot no Okay, we'll no, get there, we'll get there. I've backed I, out. No, I've backed I, I, out. I like <laughs> <it>. Coward. <laughs> I like that Redacted maybe having a podca- an audio accompaniment could somehow do some uh, multi-media, interactive media thing. Hey, if you play this podcast in sync with the episode, it fills in some missing audio. <laughs> That's so cool. What an idea. I love Thank that. Thank you. There we yeah. go. Maybe it can be like... Rather than the monster Yaz's monster case files, we can have mm-hmm. the the redacted girlies do something interlinking with the episode that aired last night. Why not? It can help make this era as gay as it was marketing itself to be. At the end of Hidden Human History, if we get a tiny cameo or allusion to a certain other time agent, then... Uh... Mm-hmm. I'm reading the room on this one. <laughs> Uh, the room is saying no. <laughs> <laughs> we are in a pre... No, it wasn't good then. There's no point where the John Barrowman controversy was fine, was it? But... Um, yeah, no, the room is saying no. Jack, Josh, then it's a recast. No. <laughs> then we're recasting. Listen, listen, I love Jack too much to have him not a part of events, and I think he's crucial to Yaz's story when we get into the next video. But that's who your new time agents can be. You've got two new characters there, Sam. Perhaps. Use them. But is any of them a long time distant lover of the Doctor? No. You're in charge here, Sam. We're in charge. I don't like that vision for the show. <laughs> <laughs> no. I like the time agency idea. And I think, uh, you know, if you want to make a spin off with them, if they work, do it. We're broadening out parts of the Doctor Who universe that we've only seen hinted at before. It's always healthy to do. It's new ideas, technically. We are into uh, pro- probably my favourite expanded media story that I got to in this. We have The Good Doctor. God, it's so good. It's the it's one of the best Doctor Who books I've ever read. In comes Juno Dawson making her mark. Jodie Hauser and Juno Dawson should both be writing for the show, even if that's not how TV works. Make it how TV works. Um, yeah, I, I mean, my notes don't really make much sense. I wrote this slap so hard. You can really tell that I wrote these notes in 2021. Very good. Very catchy with the kids. Yes. Hello, fellow kids. Uh, f- uh, I put fuck. This has so many 13th Doctor iconic moments, which it does. Yeah, she's serving cunt. If I'm, <laughs> Fuck's sake, Sam. if I'm, if I may get involved with the, <laughs> with the slang. Sorry. I think it's probably the story that I've seen that has done the most with the idea of a female doctor and does the most to combat the shitty, bigoted reaction towards the 13th doctor. 
we haven't had that big episode yet. We haven't done that mm-hmm. in this run. And without the Witchfinders, which to me was just a bit too self-explanatory, too ob- a bit too obvious. A bit petrally. I'd love the Witchfinders if it was the original vision of it. The novelization is fantastic. Ah, uh, the novelization is so good. I think, yes. I think we'll, pro- we'll get to this later because I, I have thoughts. Um, I'm a big Witchfinders defender. It's one of my favorites of the era. Mm-hmm. But I have a story that is in here later that I would possibly swap out or merge. Interesting. I like the idea that it would it would kind of blindside people a little bit. Because it's been so inoffensive till now. Yeah. It hasn't it's... showed its teeth yet by choice because I didn't want to go, you know, we've just had series 10 Capaldi. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I fucking love that stuff. But I want to get people in. I want to lure the general public in before we go trans rights. Fuck you. And yeah, I don't, I don't really have much else to say other than it's really good and please read it. Would you like to do the synopsis to take, take the reins? Uh, one sec. Let me, let me get the actual synopsis up because it's been too long. Uh, no, no, Sean Murphy, a young surgeon with autism. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't find the synopsis. So if you know it off the top of your head, please reel it off because I will be I will do it an injustice. The TARDIS gang arrive on Dog World. Um, I'm not sure what the planet is called, but they're a kind of lupine dog species. The Doctor has saved them in the past, and when the gang return, the Doctor is worshipped as a god. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of different parties. And it's very controversial her appearance being here, but mistakenly, the people decide that Graham O'Brien, this must be the aforementioned fabled Doctor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you did it. You did it better than I would have done. Hell yeah! Like it's one of those scheming plotter, plotting politician tales. The aid of the king it has great plans. It's one of those in a very mm. classic Who way. Yeah, I like it. And also, I have a little um, connective tissue change. Um, the Loba, who are the dog species in this, um, just make them the Lapari, because now now you've got the link to Flux. So what you can do is you could use this story to get rid of the species-bonded stuff in Flux, which... I like that. I like that. Sense, We're keeping species bonding. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Every dog has their own human. Um, Every dog has their own day. But you can make this story the reason why they want to help humanity. Lovely. Um, And also, uh, this is pure ridiculous fan service from me, Uh, slot in a baby carving Easter cameo here, and then he grows up wanting to be like the good doctor. Woo, 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 woo. Let's go. Exactly. And then it hurts even more when... We see Carvanista later on, and Carvanista has been betrayed by the Doctor. The placement of companions in this one is quite interesting. Graham and the 13th Doctor stay at the hub, the heart of the story, obviously. they Because you have to have the Doctor in the corner going... Rah, 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 rah. <laughs> being, a, being a woman's actually fucking awful. You have to have her for those parts. Yeah. Uh, whilst Ryan and Yaz go on two different... Um, side quests they go to the two different factions the yeah. rebels and etc um i want to reincorporate a part of the plot that doesn't really they don't really do anything with it is that this dog species is insinuated to be descendants of Laika, like Laika, the russian yeah. soviet space dog and i want let's just do that let's just make one of the companions focus in that story yeah i like that i like the that house that and 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 end the story with getting like her to safety it's just too obvious not to do one of my roles in this um thought experiment has been i don't i don't know why trying to find jobs for all of the people that we've evacuated out in the episodes that we got rid of um so um i want to get jennifer Perrett to direct this because i like i don't think the saranga conundrum is the best story of all time but i think it's I think it's well directed and I think she'd do a good job with this. And this story would it will also cost a fucking fortune. Sam, what is the budget for this series? Please tell me. I'm stressing I you, you've made me producer. You've made you've given me all of the hard things to try and tie this all together. And now you've given me 50p and a packet of wine gums to to actually make it. So how is this going to happen? You're absolutely correct. <laughs> but this is the show of cardboard dreams. Very true. Keep the dog people, 
but keep it a smaller scale story. It doesn't. We don't have to see the extent of. There's a big world map in the Good Doctor that, as a reader, you explore quite a lot. We don't need that. Yeah, the Good Doctor equals good. Then we come to the elephant in the room, in my opinion, anyway, which is Rosa. Okay, I'm team keep it. I'm team take it out. It, it okay. might just be because I read a fantastic essay about it recently, which, I mean, okay. It, you're right, this story doesn't exist in any other era, which is a good thing. But it's also because this era has bizarre, bizarre priority standards and neoliberal politics. Mm. It needs a complete overhaul. It needs yeah. Chibnall off of it. Just even optically, right? Yeah, I think I could understand that. It's hard to decide without having seen... A first draft just by a black man. Yeah, completely agree. Um, I mean, my my big note for it would be to, I, I you know, I'm not the biggest fan of the whole Crasco stuff. I feel like it's quite a common criticism of the story. Yeah, um, we can take we can take it out. I'm very much prefer it as a grounded, pure historical because I think it would actually be really ballsy for the show to do it and also do basically two of those in the first series. Yeah. Um, like, if you're going for the Hartnell era for a modern age, then just do it. Like, just, you don't have to... Yeah, the Series you, 11 is so ballsy. It's so ballsy in retrospect, and I, I but think... But it, it could have gone ballsier with this, I think. I think... It, and you do that by taking Cresco out. Yeah, exactly. If you just make it like this is something that the companions and the Doctor caused by their presence, you know, it becomes a very different kind of story. Yeah, a lot of absolutely. it is a lot of admin about people being on bus seats at the right time and planning being on the right bus seats at the right schedules. That part's bizarre. Um, mm-hmm. But I get that you could play up the ludicrousness of time travel rules. Yeah. Um, and it all has to come to a different end point, which has to be more than, oh, look, there's an asteroid named after you. It has to be Graham specifically realizing, oh, yeah, I feel guilty about this, but this isn't about me. He has to have some sort of narrative self-awareness to stop it from being the, uh, from stop it from being the Rosa of the era. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I get that. Yeah. Uh, I remember saying with a friend, what is the British Doctor Who white man line on Rosa Parks worth? Yeah. But, yeah. What is that worth? It, it's interesting to teach slightly more off the grid history, but I don't know about you. I was also taught about Rosa Parks on my syllabus in history. I was, yeah. I think I, I learned a little bit, probably, probably a bit of a whitewashed version, I, I, I'd imagine. True. Yeah. I, I I just don't know what Doctor Who can do with this. It Doctor Who has had a long-standing problem with race. Um, that's as clear as day. I think a lot of people would agree. Um, Hmm. even up until quite recently and i don't think this story clears the waters um but i mean as a story i i like it i think it's got some really good stuff between the companions i think the doctor's got really good stuff here this is where ryan um, and yaz need conflict yes and this is where yes. the doctor and graham need to conflict um and that's why it probably does work later on in the series i also think as well it works later on in the series if you did make it a pure historical, because you have that sort of subversion of expectations on the companion's part that they're probably um, expecting some... They're probably expecting some big alien threat. What I will say, the one big problem with this is that we've done the... There's no monster, there's no baddie in a historical already this season in Demons of the Punjab. Yeah, true. We have already done that. So Redo Rosa. Give Black from the stage. Um, give her give her the script. Do a adjacent civil rights story, I think, and have it instead of being a a big powerhouse drama piece. Yeah. I don't think make I don't think make it inspirational. I don't think it's Doctor Who's place to do that. I think instead needs to be a mm. complication of time travel rules story. And being a bit meta about hmm. right, well, what do what's our place in this? Uh, how how is Doctor Who as a show going to tackle the the trickier stuff? It's maybe a bit more fat brained okay. of me. Not every story needs to have an interior mission statement like that, but I think it's here. Yeah, no, I get I get what you're saying. Um, like I said, I I really like it on a whole. I don't think it's 
perfect. And I think the reasons why we've said are quite clear and quite sort of universally agreed upon. Yeah, it's, it's a, what an odd story. Yeah, it is. It, it definitely is. I mean, if to bring out my uh, silly little connective tissue brain again, for the probably the most ridiculously tiny connective tissue that I have written into this. In hidden human history, the Doctor rips her coat. We literally have the perfect through line in that the Doctor now has a ripped coat uh, for Rosa to fix. So that's... I, I don't know why. That was, that was my, my biggest... My tiniest little... Oh my God, we can actually connect these two stories in such a ridiculously minuscule way. Josh, in the, I love what you bring to the table. The Doctor's coat ripped in hidden human history because it's all it's actually always bothered me about this <laughs> obviously you know there's a lot of things that that people are bothered by in rosa the thing that really gets me <laughs> is, the doctor's coat's not ripped um <laughs> when did the doctor rip her coat um and obviously it happened in hidden human history now so uh there you go there's the, the stupid spoken sufficient. like a true doctor who fan Oh, hey, if all of this is too rocky a minefield, if there is a falling out with Mrs. Blackman for whatever reason, supposedly, uh, then fuck it. Swap out Power of the Mobox by Scott Gray. That is not one I've done, so... Uh... Don't worry about it. It's some big, dumb comic. Uh, it's in the Doctor Who magazine range, which we're going to get more into in the next season. Um, Scott Gray just wrote a big Jack Kirby. Oh, nice. Send off. Nice. Yeah, it's big and colourful, and there's big globo monsters who go blah, 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 blah. Fucking throw that in. Why not? Nice. Nice. Budget again? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you're really trying to kill funny. the BBC with this, aren't you? You're really trying to bankrupt the BBC. Mr. Strevens, my pitch for Power of the Mobox is that we film it like an 80s Doctor Who set-bound adventure with the same production values. <laughs> Film it like Warriors of the Deep, damn you. Terminus. Why don't we say Terminus? Why don't we be a little bit ambitious in our times? <laughs> would that not be funny? Okay, let's let's do that. It would be funny to have a very 80s-style Doctor Who story, just out of nowhere, not not explained. Not purposely crap. It- no, purpose. No, purposely crap. Make it purposely crap. No, I don't think purposely crap. You like time lash. I'm not trusting your judgments. <laughs> I think, I think it looks like how the resurrection of the Daleks bit from It's a Sin. That's what it I was looks literally like. just about to say. That. I think you get away with that. And the thirteenth Doctor just says, you know, some some plants look like this. Yeah, make it look like that. I like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's a good gag. Back on the serious ones, but not that serious, actually. It's old friends. For all of Series 11's misjudgments, it keeps the completely original stories and characters. There's nothing returning from the past. And technically, old friends doesn't have a character we've seen in the show either. No, just one that's been alluded to, because it's a Corsair story, which is fun. Yes, yes, but if they're like the Corsair, they're good ones, and I can save them. Neil Gaiman's Corsair. Um... Yeah. It's a Titan comic story. We're going back to Jodie Hauser for the third time in this series. Can you tell where I got a lot of my inspiration here from? The Doctor has a SpaceX. Yeah. It's kind of that simple. There's there's a roguish, similar Time Lord runaway, because the Time Lords are still very much alive. <laughs> she has flings with the Doctor. But the Doctor is super goody two-shoes to her more swashbuckling, roguish adventures. Yeah. She has a Han Solo girlfriend in her back pocket. That's the, but that, yeah, and that's where the fun comes from. This is the Yaz shipping episode. This is, this is where Yaz's affections for the Doctor become text, even if the Doctor doesn't see it. The 13th Doctor's main character flaw is going to be her general passivity, and the fact that she is just a fairly neutral hero archetype. And I think that's going to come into play in this story in a major way, because we've got Goody Two-Shoes hero archetype versus Han Solo rogue archetype. So it's going to really start like saying out loud the parts of 13 that 
um, the companions are exasperated by. I think it will make 13 more likable in the long run, because she doesn't have to be snappy or bitey. She's just, you know, pleasant and a little bit docile and a little bit ditzier than she was on TV. Um, but why would you ever want to change that? We do what all the best romantic stories in Doctor Who do. We use Madame de Pompadour or Sarah Jane Smith as a parallel to our main companion, who yeah. also has romantic yeah. feelings. It's, it writes itself. For new viewers, they're not going to be like, who's this? Because for all intents and purposes, we're introducing a new character. I just like the Corsair finally being made into a thing. The Doctor and co arrive in a space bar, and who is at the bar but the Doctor's long-standing ally, friend, it's unclear, the Corsair. And the Corsair's got a new job that she needs help with. Um, will sh the Doctor and co help her free a bunch of star whales? Well, it's recognising the fact that, okay, Doctor Who's been back for like 13, 14 years at this point, um, so now we need to do this all over again but also doing it with someone that we've not met yet just adds a nice little element of originality to it. Um, and it also means that mm. everybody gets to experience that that freshness of this character. My casting brain for the Corsair went, went wild. Because usually, I mean, my go-to casting for the Corsair is, is Matt Berry. Uh, that kind of <laughs> just because I just think I think Matt Berry is sort of the, the one guy who works for casting any established Time Lord you're whitewashing the Corsair interesting I am. Yeah. <laughs> I mean one who looks literally exactly like the picture um, which is Kate Siegel um, from like Haunting the Haunting series she's in Haunting of Bly Manor she's in everything that Mike Flanagan makes Fantastic. Great actress. She's really, really cool. And she also looks exactly like the drawings yes. of the Corsair in this comic. Um, I've got a, a slightly more out there shout. Um, mm -hmm. And forgive me if I'm butchering the pronunciation of this, but um, I think it's Celine Hisley, who is in Am I Being Unreasonable? Ooh. With Daisy May Cooper. Um, she's sort of Daisy May Cooper's mysterious friend in Am I Be Being Unreasonable? And I think she'd really play this quite well because she's really fun in that series. Michaela Cole um, is also the spitting image of a different incarnation of the Corsair. Nice. Yeah, so she'd be great. There's there's different Corsairs. Hey, if you really want to have fun with casting, she can be a different actress every time she shows up. Yeah, that would be really cool. And yeah, I just, I, I, I think if you are going to do the Corsair, that would be the most fun way to bring the Corsair back every time, is just a different actor every single time. I will point out that this run, this entire revised Whitaker era, has no master in it. Yeah. We'll get to that next video. Um, there's, there's no returning Time Lords. I have debates about this, but I... It's 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 not a, it's not an idea I agree with. Absolutely. Because I think it's a very it's a very Sam idea, isn't it? Let's okay. be honest. It's a very. <laughs> <laughs> it. We'll talk about it then, but there, there are things I would rather focus on. It's not just because it's not just master hatred. It's those stories do not fit, are the polar opposite yeah. of yeah the heart of this new series for me. It's the opposite of what I'm going for. So to include them, even if it is a rejection of them in the end, mm, okay. I'd rather spend that time with Scott Gray, personally. And that comes from a place of, a of adoration, not uh, canon denial. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, old friends just fits. I don't really have any notes. I think just do it exactly as it is. Um, Small budget. I don't it, doesn't, it doesn't yeah, need to be as big as the comic. It doesn't need massive. No, it doesn't need a massive budget. Um I'm sure there's a pirate ship rocking around somewhere because a pirate ship TARDIS is also a very, very, very fun concept. It, it um, could also just be the like the captain's quarters of an of a of a pirate ship, or like a barrel, like a, a barrel. Big the barrel. TARDIS being a ba a big barrel, and you have to jump <laughs> into it. <top> <laughs> <top>. <laughs> yeah, and then you land. You just land in the console room. Bradley Walsh. <laughs> yeah, he. They'd have fun with that. I'm sure. That's okay, really so fun. we're sold on the Corsair and old friends. 
Yeah, very cast, solid. Very, cast very and solid. everything. Uh, any choice of director? Um, I don't. Who else have we sacked? Um, <laughs> <laughs> they never existed in this timeline. <laughs> very sure. What, we've erased them from history? Yes. I don't want to do that. Yes. Um, I don't know. Uh, I can't think of anybody. Who did Witchfinders? I have. Th- th- this actually leads me into the next story, where we probably have our first, mm, oh, maybe not our first big disagreement, because we were both a bit on opposite sides about Rosa. Because the next episode is Combat Magics, which is a fun book. I like it. It's got some good stuff in it. But I don't know if it trumps the Witchfinders. Okay. I can be reasoned with on this. Okay. Combat Magics isn't doing anything revolutionary. I think so many of the ones I've picked are there for subversive reasons. Yeah. And I think I just wanted a caper and to get my boy Steve Cole some some work. Steve Cole's... The, I mean, it is a really good book. It's a really, really good book. Stephen Cole's had enough work, actually. Looking at his Doctor Who... <laughs> yeah, I mean, line up. I do think there is a there is a version of this that's like a really tight TV script. The platform of it being a book probably does it more of a disservice than if it was a TV story. I think it would probably be better served as a TV story. So maybe that's a reason to put it in. Combat Magics, the Doctor and Cobalt go get caught by Attila the Hun, essentially. Um, except they have a kind of sorcery science that they shouldn't have. That's as simple as it is. It's quite self-explanatory Doctor Who. There's a lot of cool imagery described to you, which really got me. And it's a funny story. Yeah. But um, it is a bit flabby. I did have a pitch to move, rather than us bin off one of this or the Witchfinders, but maybe move this to series 12. I think this could work as a series 12 story. Or perhaps series, perhaps the specials. Because you know what I'm going to do with the specials. Yes. I lo- Yes. Well, we can discuss this. We can discuss this. I agree with that. Okay. I mean, while, while we're on Combat Magics, it is really good. Because Ryan and Yaz are really, really good. And really well handled. And Graham is probably the one that suffers a bit. There's a lot of anime sounding action in it. Which is a lot of fun. A lot of RPG fun in this. Thrown into like a... Dennis Spooner style. Yeah. Historical. It also has probably one of my favourite concepts ever introduced in Doctor Who. It deserves its own spin-off because the Legion of Smoke is the coolest idea in Doctor Who because it's like Torchwood in ancient Rome. (laughs) So fucking cool. And as we previously said, the Witchfinder's novelisation, let Joy Wilkinson do her uh, like finished vision of the story it, the 13th doctor isn't a main character in it anymore you have to keep in all those asides you have to follow the new cast and yaz's comparison of the witch hunt being akin to her childhood bullying it, it's a really great way to explain sordid history to a kid it's, it's impossible to say no to i can't say no to you josh yeah i know you can't it's because i'm a it's because i'm a silver tongue devil i just love the witch finders i just think I wouldn't put it in my top five of the era, but it is just, it just typifies the era for me. I just, I find it so cosy. It's just lovely, cosy Sunday night viewing. This is your one. This is your one. And also Jodie is really good in it. I think Jodie gets a full range in that story. Maybe I don't like excusing the king for all of his crimes. Um, True. Maybe I don't like yeah. that. Maybe I'd tone that part down. Maybe. I think we have to decide whether that or the good doctor are taking the beats of, I am in a woman's body now. In a history story, I am now scared. Mm. The doctor has to be scared yeah. because, as me and my friend Michelle pointed out in our video on it, if the doctor is above um, human sexism of the time, that implies that other brilliant, daring women of the past weren't. You know what I mean? The Doctor has to be victim to the the, the injustices of the past. She has to be. Which Mm -hmm. is a new fear for her. Two stories of that might be too much. Maybe. Maybe. Well, anyway, it's a it's a thought exercise, isn't it? It's always fun to. I like this. This is this is probably the. I like it because this is the spot that I've sort of thought about the most. Every even what like going into series twelve and series thirteen, I keep coming back to this one, and I'm like, there's a jigsaw here that really fits. But it's like you said because 
like it, the vibe similarities with the combat magics means that you can't have both in there at the same time. And then the story beats in terms of the female doctor similarities with the good doctor means you can't have both of them at the same time. So juggling those three stories is tough, mm-hmm. but it's fun. I like I like the idea of having the witch finders in here and maybe combat magics as a special. Yeah, I, th- I think we'll go forward with that. Which takes us on to our season finale. The Battle of Rantkorav No, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I was tinkering. Uh, I've before in a previous video said how I would try to tighten up Avkolos, the colonoscopy of I, I don't think it's rank long. Terrible at all. I don't think it's the worst. It's a first draft, man. I've, I feel like there's there's so many Doctor Who stories that get labelled the worst episode of Doctor Who ever, and I just don't think it's that. Avkolos doesn't deserve to stay. There's things in Avkolos I like. Um, it's a pretty story. It's well directed. Um, but it doesn't deserve to stay. I was tinkering with ideas on like, what if we do make it a Graham story and Ryan and Ryan and Graham split off going for the revenge routes whilst it's down to the 13th Doctor and Yaz to try and stop them, save them from themselves. So we have two fact two different TARDIS team factions using the big TARDIS team to have them fight each other. That's something. Do I think it should be the season finale? There's something in there. No, it's not the be- it like it's like the Beatles beam. Where it's like is Battle of Ryan Square of Colos the best series finale? It's not even the best series finale in series yes. eleven. Um because the one that you've picked should have been the series finale. Because thematically it doesn't really make sense to go from this story, what we're gonna talk about, which is it takes you away and then go straight to a revenge arc. But it takes you away is one of my favourite episodes of Doctor Who of all time. It is my all time favourite Jodie Whittaker story. I think it is a ten out of ten Ooh. all round. I just, I, I, I think it's just a blueprint for um, what the weirdness levels that Doctor <laughs> Who should always be trying to hit. Audience, Josh. If you said to me, "Frog on a chair," and it's a universe. I go, oh, so we're watching Doctor Who today, are we? <laughs> Every season needs to present one. What the hell am I actually looking at image? One per season, one per season. Exactly. Um, but uh, so, uh, beyond the frog, obviously I've picked, it takes you away as the finale for what it does with Graham and in this version, Ryan, I hope. Uh, is, is that what you're doing with Ryan here? Okay, so Ryan in the story is put on the backbench. The Doctor knowingly tells him to stay behind. Yeah. And we, even before we know that it's Grace themed, it's thematically consistent with the rest of it. Mm-hmm. The reason the Doctor tells him to stay behind is that message on the wall, that, that brilliant message, which is um, Dad might be dead, make sure she's safe. Watching back, I think 13 writes that message also for Ryan to keep him safe. Um, something we have not played up in these specials is that in Woman Who Fell to Earth, the Doctor arrives at Grace's funeral and is watching him on that hill try and ride that bike. She kind of adopts him. Yeah. D- does the series ever do anything with that? Not really. <sighs> no, and that's quite surprising from, from, from where we actually end up that that doesn't really get... I mean, I suppose they try it a little bit in revolution a little bit but, but like think, think back to the 60s and what the doctor was doing with victoria that was really impressive character stuff for the time and even for now yeah and i think just a fraction of helping this lost lo- loves traveling kid making sure he lands on his feet yeah and she feels responsible obviously like there, 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 there should be a level of is she being irresponsible by being responsible because her idea of being responsible is to whisk him off into time and space and put him in danger it's a episode about parenthood and crappy parents exactly so if, you, if you don't tell this story now there's not going to be a better opportunity down the road yeah well like i said i mean i think it's a 10 out of 10 as it is but you know if if you're gonna just add more good character work in then a, you know we can <laughs> we can just max it out we can make this an 11 out of 10 sam we can make what, it what i said about ranskara of kolos and two factions and the tardis working against one another yeah. that could still happen here yeah it could still be ryan and graham fighting for something um 
in the solid track dimension and the doctor and Yaz eager to make sure they don't mm-hmm. fall to their trauma and get lured in the same way that the dad has who's a really good parallel for Graham yeah this this is the, the perfect example of a three person TARDIS team can work it is bigger in scale than the other episodes because this finale is a full on drama like it doesn't have to be big budget to feel bigger and more important than the other episodes. It's a different kind of finale that we haven't done. We still haven't done yet in the revival. It's the character drama that is. I mean, it is Chibnall's strength. Like in, in other shows, like I still am a big fan of Chibnall as a writer. I think he's really got a lot of good qualities. I don't think Doctor Who is his favorite of my work of his work for me. No, Torture um, for me. Yeah, I think he's great in Torchwood, but then also I think Broadchurch series one and two um, are really, really good. I think he, <laughs> give him he a wrote... Broadchurch finale. It's so exactly. obvious to me. And what what he does is he get he he gives great actors because he he adores actors. He yeah. a- is absolutely in awe of his cast. But what his scripts do, he doesn't think of himself as a big part of the process, which is yeah. failing. But admirable he just wants to create a platform for good actors to strut their stuff he wants yeah. them to run with it and that didn't really work for doctor who but it absolutely did for broadchurch mm-hmm. yeah so just do broadchurch for fuck's sake you're chris chibnall yeah. i mean my, my favorite thing that chibnall's ever done is actually quite little known i think he did a he did a tv movie about manchester united um and the uh, the Manchester United like Busby Babes uh, air crash in the fifties, which is fucking phenomenal. Yeah, he just writes that sort of drama so well, and that's why I think his historicals are, are, are so good as well because you know he's he's sort of well versed in that. Um, but obviously he didn't write it. Um, no, no, that's just, what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I did have to interject at some point. It's going to yeah, have to be a co-write, write co-writing credit, which yeah, which yeah. hasn't gone well in the past. But actually, that's not true. Uh, Praxius, my favourite Woods career story is a Chris oh, Chibnall yeah. co-write credit. Like so We'll get on to Praxius. So Chris Chibnall and Ed Heim co-writing and making a drama piece because I think it takes you away from what we know, had a pretty rocky production yeah. cycle, didn't it? Like, it, it, things were weird. We're definitely putting in that cut content. Yeah. And the, the weird Dementor costume, because even if it's just on screen for a second, why would you cut that out? Mm-hmm. They brought it to sets. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there's really not that much to change with it takes you away. I don't want to, anyway. Yeah. I wouldn't want to either. I think it's bang on. You could maybe just tweak to make it sort of a a full series ending point. Right, obviously the ending of the episode is a character-based thing with no action. But before that, if we are going to have some Doctor versus Companion conflict in the tunnels, I think it would be really funny for uh, Ryan and Graham, etc. to arm themselves with the dad and for Thasmin to get in the TARDIS and maybe get a bit practical with some of the traps and preventional methods they're doing to stop them getting to their destination. Mm. Help. Maybe maybe the spiders swarm from that episode that we cut. <laughs> maybe the, the droid from A New Beginning, yeah. the gold droid, drifts out and blocks the path. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the gold droid can finally come back. Just reference some old adventures and throw them in as uh, r- blocking their path. We don't have Doctor versus Companion nearly yeah. enough. Uh, Yaz does stand up to the Doctor sometimes, but you have to remember that this Doctor is less... Like, you'd have to be a real dickhead to have a problem with this Doctor, as I'm writing her, because she's just so agreeable and feckless mm-hmm. to the point that she'd probably be a little bit annoying to talk to. After yeah. a, She'd be annoying to hang out with for a long period of time, because you never argue with her because <laughs> she's so light. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I want from 13. And that's a 13 we get in series 11, which... And this is the end of series 11, which I like. It works. Yeah? It works. It did work. So, You're not um, just saying this that. This really works. I like... No, I, 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 think this is, I think this is the one that I, that I probably agree with the most. Mm-hmm. We spend a lot of time in the past. 
We do. Big, the big the budget is way too big and we spent a lot of time in the past. No, but that's fine because that's where the strengths mm-hmm. are in the era. Well, I don't mind sacrificing this sort of made up 50-50 split that we need of past, future, past, future, past, future. When we're dealing with a lot of social change, it's good to look at historical stories because that's where you can explore a lot of that and look at Earth history mm. and stuff. Um, I just think, yeah, it really works. I like that it's you still sort of keep the anth- like sort of the anthology type stories of Series 11 where they're all separated, but you get the little interconnected tissues um, like the Horder, the Time Agency, blah, 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 and the Corsair coming in. So it's like the best of both worlds. And also another thing I love is that there's just no end of the world plots. It's just... You're right. It, you know, yeah, it's, the, the, it's... We've had so many... The stakes get? This is the biggest Doctor Who story of all time. And it's just how many times... If you do that all of the time, then they it has no stakes left. I think the biggest in scale we get is a terrorist attack in the collateral of Ivanhoe. Um, yeah, and pretty much. the partition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty big. Um, I just... <laughs> Yeah, but I just, I just, I just love the fact that it's not like, oh my god, everybody on planet Earth is going to die, mm-hmm. um, and it's much more character driven. Um, Thank you. And a lot of that is um, in the highlights of series eleven and in the comic stuff and the books. Um, that's sort of the strengths of it. I didn't write them. Uh- <laughs> You didn't write them, very <laughs> but true. I did collate them. <laughs> you just put them together. You just collated them into into one section, and then you did add on at the yes, end for you. the Titan Holiday Special, the Titan Holiday Special, um, which is I just put. This is fun and weird. I like it. <laughs> um, so before uh, this Christmas, when we had Christmas Goblins with Shooty Gatwa, um, Titan Comics for Jody's the end of Jody's first run, they did a Christmas special. Uh, when the TV show wasn't doing them, it went, no, Doctor and Yaz and co, they go to Lapland and they meet Father Christmas and Elves and the Krampus. Fuck you. <laughs> 13 was made for Christmas. Um, and it's a shame that she never got like a proper Christmas special on screen, even though I do love the New Year's Day ones. That gone for um, me. There is no resolution here. See, no, I'm fighting you on this. Nope. <laughs> it's not, no, I'm telling you, it's not out. there. Okay. Hear me out. Hear okay. me out. Hear me out. Let's go big on the festive period. Christmas special, New Year's Day special. Let's have both. We can do it. Hmm. Titan holiday on Christmas Day. Okay. And then resolution on New Year's Day because I love resolution and I am one of its biggest defenders. I think it is one of the best Dalek stories in New Who. I'm very resistant, you know. I know um, everybody is. I don't know. I don't. Why does everybody not like Resolution? Let's not get into it now. After a lovely no. good video, after a happy. <laughs> team I work love video. it. Well, I'll. I'm going to say I love Resolution. <laughs> you know what? You know what? For you, as a as a Christmas miracle, as a late Thank Christmas you. present to you. On the 30th of January, as we're recording this. <laughs> Released much later, I'm sure. Um, we will find a way to make resolution good enough. <laughs> off screen, off camera. Merry Christmas, everybody. The, the Titan Holiday Special. Have you done the synopsis yet? Uh, they go to Lapland and there's elves. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, that was it. And there's also... There's also uh, a, a Santa sort of Krampus type villain called Mr. Henderson, which is really silly and I like it. Um, but basically, sometimes he looks like Santa, like big, butch, burly Santa. Uh, and sometimes he looks like a big, lean Hellboy. So I'm going to say, casting wise, if we can get David Harbour to do the best of both worlds so that he can do his Violent Night Santa and then he can do his Hellboy. And I think it just really works. So let's get David Harbour in. To wrap up, it was um, a wo- The Woman Who Fell to Earth leading into A New Beginning, Demons of the Punjab for our past episode, The Collateral of Ivanhoe, Hidden Human History, the Good Doctor, Rosa, 
Hmm. Old friends. Combat magics replaced by the witch finders. And it takes you away. Followed up by the Titan holiday special. And resolution. I think it works. It works. Resolution at the end works. I suppose we need to introduce Jack Robertson for next time. Yeah, we do. So go ahead. You have it. You have it. I just like silly Dalek fun. And you know what? There's a good place in my heart for that too. If if, yes. if a kid also is going to be like, where's the Daleks? We should probably give him a Dalek. There's been no recurring villains in this series. So I say... One, you get one, Dalek. You, but so you may have one, only one. Thank you very much. Thanks for giving me a Dalek. Merry Christmas. My favourite character in all of Doctor Who, <laughs> Dalek. <laughs> Mine too. How crazy is that, <laughs> Mister Dalek? <sighs> okay, I I think we should wrap up here and do season twelve and specials another night. You sure? I think so because this has gotten bigger. It's it's become a bigger project, and I'm not. I don't want to cut it or rush it. Okay, well let's do that then. Doctor, seriously, my decision. Whatever you want, just promise me you'll let him go. You are my prisoners now. <laughs>